on the cross of Calvary. We have a legacy of love, grace to do greater works, and faith to see the unseen hand of God at work. You won't stand long today. I'm going to read with my um, with my school reading. I'm going to go a little bit fast, but I want to read to you, if we would go to John the 11th chapter. We're still in our series on reclaiming our men, on reclaiming our men. And so, Sister Olive, you be seated because it may be a little bit for you to stand that long. And I appreciate you wanting to stand today for the reading of God's word, but we're in observation of your medical condition and we're believing God for your um, turnaround. Amen. John 11th chapter, when you have it, please say amen. 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 And it reads in the first 16 verses. I know that's a lot, but hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness, somebody catch this on today. Sister Ali, catch this on yes. today. This sickness is not unto death, but the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard thereof that he was sick, he abode two days. Jesus procrastinated. Come on here. He abode two days still in the same place where he was, not where they wanted him to be. Then after that... He, he said he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. And the disciples are looking like, are you crazy? The folks there in Judea, you barely got out the last time. And if you go back in, we're worried that you ain't going to come out this time. You mean to tell us you're going back to Judea? Verse 8, his disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. And goest thou thither again? You going to go there again? You going to take us there again? Because his disciples, we're supposed to be following following you. So now our life is in danger. Anybody understand the text today? Then answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, this is Jesus, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in night, in other words, y'all got to come on now while it's day. But if the man walketh at night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. Verse 11 says, these things were already in verse 11, said he, and after that he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Because what Jesus is doing here is he's teaching them that he is but sleep because I'm going to wake him up. But they were just like, well, if he sleep, uh, uh, Jesus, then he is all right because all of us tired and we want to go to sleep. We tired of wrestling with demons and devils and now you're trying to take us back to a space to whereas we're going to have to wrestle for our lives. Verse 12 says, Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he does well. He shall do well. How be it Jesus spake of his death? But they thought that he had spoken of taken of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, because sometimes Jesus got to give it to us just right. like this. Lazarus is dead. Your marriage is dead. Your child is wayward. Your money ain't even funny. Come on here, somebody. Verse 15 says, am I glad and I am glad for you, for your sakes, that I was not there. I was glad that I stayed here in abode for your sake. Because it's not just for Lazarus, but it's for you because I'm trying to show you something. Yeah. To the intent ye may believe, nevertheless, because you walking with me and don't believe. Yeah. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Verse 16, this is, the, you know, Thomas, ain't, the first time Jesus sees Thomas is not when he walks through the wall and let him know that he is off the cross. Come on. Beyond the grave. Yeah. But Thomas had a problem that seemed to be consistent because verse 16 says, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow, meaning double-minded, unto his fellow disciples, he talking trash. He said, y'all, come on, let's go over here so we can die too. He going to raise Lazarus, but by the time we get to the border of, of where we're going, we're going to die too. Oh. Run on down here, if you can still stand, to verse 43. And verse 44, and I will leave you alone and let you be seated. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. 
verse 44, and you'll be on your way to your seat. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Yes, I have preached from John 11 before, but today God gives us revelatory insight in his word. We're not going to talk about how then Lazarus was dead and he was dead and Jesus abode and Jesus procrastinated for two days so that the miracle could be real good. We know that he was stinking and that it was a stinking mess, but we also have more intentional things that we can get out of the text today. The Holy Ghost is going to show out in part two of reclaiming our men series to tell us to take the grave clothes off how many of you understand that we're and we're talking from that subject today take off your grave clothes take off your grave clothes too many of us are walking around dressed for a funeral too many of us are walking around unaddressed in life therefore we are dressed for the funeral our focus scripture today is in, is, is there in verses 43 and 44 and 44. We are continuing today with the series on reclaiming our men. We are praying with great anticipation and expectation of what God would do as a result of our prayers and intentionality regarding our relationships with our brothers, our fathers, our cousins, our uncles, our friends, and our neighbors. We believe that God will restore all who are willing as we pray and as we anticipate and as we expect that God will do something that will leave us awe stricken and yet amazed at his glorious works, it is important for us to take survey of our reality. While I talked about Thomas, Thomas was indeed taking survey of his reality. Mary and Martha were taking survey of their reality. The reality is that our brothers are sick. Come on here, somebody. The reality is our fathers, our uncles, our cousins, our friends, our neighbors, that they are sick. And when they are sick, then our houses are sick. Our communities are sick. Even our churches, come on here, church, are sick. Alarming reports of the rate of incarceration of black men are being produced in a high volume. The Sentencing Project, which is a project that focuses on research and advocacy for reform reports. Number one, that black Americans are are incarcerated in state prisons at nearly five times the rate of white Americans. Number two, nationally, one in 84 black adults per 100,000 in the U.S. is serving time in a state prison. Wisconsin leads the nation in black imprisonment rates. One of every 36 black Wisconsinites is in prison. Can I give you the facts? Number three, in 12 states, more than half the prison population is black. Those would be Alabama, Delaware, come here, Georgia, that got some voting issues, Illinois, come on here, somebody. Can I walk it today? Louisiana, Maryland, Michigan, Mississippi, New Jersey, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. Number four, seven states maintain black-white disparity larger than nine to one. California, Connecticut, Iowa, Maine, Minnesota, New Jersey, and Wisconsin, Latina, our Latinx brothers and sisters. Those individuals are incarcerated in state prisons at a rate that is 1.3 times the incarceration rate of white people. Ethnic disparities are highest in Massachusetts with reports an ethnic differential of 4.1 to 1. According to an article entitled, because I got to give you all the facts just in case the devil tunes in a little bit later. According to an article entitled, Black Incarceration Rates Are Dropping in the U.S. on Statista.com by Katharina Buckholtz on February the 19th, Devil, 2021. The incarceration rate of black men in the U.S. has been dropping after reaching an all-time high in 2001, but it's still too high. Yet the rate at which you black U.S. men are in prison is still many times that of white and more than double that of the Hispanic male population, showing a huge racial discrepancy and the criminal justice system. Are you still here? Yes. 
The article also states that according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, 2,203 black men out of 100,000 were held in state or federal prisons in the U.S. during 2019 after being sentenced. That's roughly one in 45 of our men. So if we put 45 brothers in the room today, one of them is going to be in prison. That number doesn't include people in the county jails or those who are waiting pre-trial confinement. On October October the 5th, 2021, Statista Research Department published the following. In 2020, I'm gonna leave you alone here, but I gotta give Come you the on. facts. In 2020, there were about 4.25 uh, million black families of the United States of America with a single mother. Let me give that to you one more time. 4.25 million black families in the United States with a single mother. This is an increase from 1990 levels when there were about 3.4 million black families with a single mother. What has this got to do with what we're talking about in John 11? I'll tell you if you stay with me. Yes. Church, we have a dilemma, and I wanted to paint that dilemma to you today. Yes. I have not even mentioned the racial disparities of deaths from COVID or what I would like to consider young black people in the age range of mine, 35 to 44. I just barely escaped out of that. Black people, indigenous people, and Latinx people are dying at yes. higher rates of their counterparts within the same ranges ranges at alarming rates. Yes. Have I mentioned the war with drugs and alcoholism that's on our streets in our community? I've talked about COVID, but what about drugs and alcohol? Have I mentioned gun violence in our community? Have I talked about domestic violence in the black community? Have I talked about reproductive loss when we promote same-sex marriage within our community and abortion? Have I mentioned a study that shows pandemic tied to spikes in suicide among black people? We are dying, but if we can live. I am not here to judge by any means in this climate of the present hour when we are observing Black History Month. I encourage you to think on these things while celebrating because we can celebrate real good, have the barbecue today. We're going to gather up and we're going to have chips. We're going to have salsa. We're going to have wings and things. We're going to have alcohol, y'all. We're going to have everything going on today, but I want to catch you before you get to the party today to shake you and let you know you ain't getting no check no ring from the Super Bowl today so don't be getting into it shooting each other over who won the game today sit yourself down and understand it's alright to watch the game it's alright to root for your favorite team on today but we've got work to do we've got work to do I encourage you to think on these things while we're celebrating those who paved the way. We must consider what the future looks like because the bricks are falling. If we do not consider the aforementioned, then black history itself will be just that, history. Our mere existence is on the line. We must reclaim our men who bear the seed necessary to keep our race persisting. If you are white, if you are of any other culture today and you're listening to me today, don't tune me out yet. I just got to speak to black folks because I am one of them. We must reclaim our men who bear the seed. I want to cause you to think that if we perish as a people, who can we trust to tell our story in the face of this debate of black history being a American history, especially when the, this is a clarion call today, especially when there is such a bait over the teaching of the critical race theory and that people are talking about not teaching our history. We will lose our history if we don't learn how to tell the story. Our storytellers are now dead. They have died with COVID, those that knew the story. And the problem was we were not seated at their feet to learn the story. Why? Because we were busy selling drugs. We were busy with alcohol. We were busy with the Facebook and social media, but we've got to learn how to put the vocal narrative grandmother instead of you being at the club dropping it hot with generations of your daughters. You need to be telling them the story. I know what I'm talking about because when I was working over in Boji as a pastor, I remember going to the sheriff's office and they were telling me how they would have generations of women in jail at the same time. Mama, you're 40 years old and your daughter is now 35, your daughter is 25 years old and your 
daughter got a girl who may be about uh, 10 years old and the 10 year old out there don't know what school is all about and she's getting an early start and she's going, getting ready to go to juvie and y'all are in jail because y'all got into it. We need to have some real conversation. This is the season where we got to stop blinking at what's going on in our family and address the devil. Young folks, you got to open up your ears to hear what somebody is saying to you. If you don't hear somebody, you're not going to hear nobody, and you're going to end up in a bad situation. God put our ancestors here to speak the word of truth into us, and so ancestors, we got to make sure that we are speaking. Remember when the Bible talks about the monuments that they built so that the children can ask? Why are these stones here? And those stones will give you the opportunity to tell the story. Then we got to tell our story. We got to learn what the story is. We got to know what happened to Big Daddy. We got to know the ugly stuff so we don't repeat the ugly stuff. We got to learn how to love our loved ones separate of the mess that they may have created. To still, I can tell you, God can let you still love them and yet still know what went wrong so that you can do the right thing. What do we do within the reality of our day to ensure a better tomorrow for all God's people? How do we walk in unity when we do, when we how do we walk in unity when we don't agree? We have to learn how to come together. We have to learn how to bring the word of God with us to the table and not just policies. Because I'm telling you, policy without the word of God is not going to cause unity. Perhaps you are thinking that I forgot about the text, but I want to assure you that I am well in the text today. I'm going to show you the things that I had never seen in this text today that the Lord revealed unto me. Many of us, if we have hung around the church for any length and breadth of time, have heard the story of this Lazarus. Lazarus of Bethany, you may not shout today, but give me your ear. Lazarus of Bethany was a close friend of Jesus. Lazarus' sister Mary and Martha were aware of the relationship that their brother had with Jesus. Anybody got a brother, you know that if some people may say about your brother, well, you know he does this and he does that. And that boy ain't no way that boy know God. But this is what Mary and Martha knew for sure. They knew that their brother knew God. Sometimes you got to check what the word on the street is. And you got to tell the devil, no, my brother knows God. You got to tell them that's why we're calling God because we know that he is sick. And so we're going to call for his friend Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Glory to God. And it says here that Mary and Martha were aware of the relationship that their brother had with Jesus. Perhaps others had not understood the depth of the relationship. Just because you don't see Lazarus at the synagogue lifting up his hands and carrying the, the offering tray does not mean that in his home he doesn't have a prayer time. As a matter of fact, you come to church, but Lazarus has brought Jesus to his house because there's a whole bunch of folks that come to church and they have a two-hour relationship with the Lord, but he ain't at their house. So come here, Lazarus. Says, you pray at the house, but you probably went down at the church building. That's all right, too, because I hate to come to the church and and not have God in my house. But the sisters obviously knew thereof because they knew to call Jesus when Lazarus became sick. Perhaps there are those of my brothers in particular today who may look at you, they may look at you and by looking at you and by doing so they perceive that you don't know the Lord well. But they don't know how in the prison cell you call upon the name of Jesus. Yeah, you got a prison record, but it took the prison record because you had more Jesus in that jail that some of them had on a Sunday morning with a couple of acres, acres and a couple of square footage in that little box, in that little square space. You met God. You had been going to church all your life and had never met God, but it was something about that jail cell that you met God. So why do we judge people? Come on here, somebody. Instead of judging the brother because he went to jail, why don't you tell somebody? I hope that the Lord meets him there. If he wasn't able to meet him at my house, then God meet him in the penitentiary, God. I know that you're the God that you can get behind locked doors. Come on here, somebody. If he got shut up last night and he's in the intensive care, just say, Lord, speak to him now, God, in the name of Jesus. I thank God that Lazarus lived in the presence of his sisters on the shame tree of his relationship with Jesus. Church, it is easier to come into agreement with you in your time of need when people already know who you know and how
how you feel about Jesus. While we celebrate the story and how that Jesus made sure that Lazarus was dead and really dead and surely stinking dead so that the miracle could be undeniable for Thomas and all other, the, and all other witnesses. Remember verses 14 and 16. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. You feel like it's over with your son. You feel like it's over with your community. They told you that that boy is serving a life sentence, but how many of you know that God is a God that can release them from the hand of the enemy? Church, do we really believe? I told you that there are going to be some early releases, but there won't be any premature releases. Why? Because prematurity says that I ain't fully developed in that thing. But when you send God to the jail cell, come on here somebody, when you send God to the hospital, there will be a full recovery and an early release from that thing. And I am glad for your sex is what the word of God says, that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called double-minded Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. There are some people that ain't believing that you gonna come out, but I'll deal with Thomas right here. You have not my first point today. I got three major points and I'm gonna leave you alone. My, my, my first point is that you have to watch Thomas. You got to watch Thomas. In our political arenas, we got some Thomases. Come on here. No, it ain't just Uncle Tom, but you got Thomas from the Bible before you ever meet Uncle Tom. Come on here, y'all. Judas will expose himself clearly, but you have to watch old double-minded Thomas who will go along for the mission. We got a whole bunch of homeboys. You got some homeboys that they're along for the mission, but they will turn on you. We got them in the White House. We got them in your neighborhood. We even got them in the church. Thomas may be sitting on the deacon board. Maybe Thomas sits in the chair in the pulpit next to pastor on Sunday. You going along for the mission but you are double-minded. How many of the people serving in the church are double-minded? They attend all the services and they fellowship with Jesus and follow Jesus but they do not believe him. Can I tell you that it's not enough for you to just be a follower of Jesus Christ because Thomas was following. Can I tell you that Judas was following? You have got to trust the God who you follow. Oh, well, I'm a disciple. Oh, I follow Christ. I ain't impressed with you until I can see that you can trust God. So many people will show up for the march but won't show up at the polls to vote. So many people will show up for the march but will not show up to the school or to support the ball game. So many people will post about the problem on social media but will not show up to use their voice in the courtroom. Some will even post R-I-H-R-I-P-R-I-L but will not provide for you a rest on earth. Be mindful of Thomas. Thomas comes along for the mission but doesn't believe that the commander will give the instructions and the, and the instructions will cause destruction to the kingdom of the devil. He is the one that drains others of their hope. Thomas ought to just shut up. He was not even concerned with the fact that the Lord has stated that Lazarus had died. He was only concerned with himself. He was not concerned about Lazarus's family. You got to understand that there are politicians out there today who are not public servants. What are the politicians? They don't care that you're hungry. They don't care that you lost a man at your house during COVID. They don't care that there are little kids out there who lost both their mother and father during COVID. All they care about is how you going to feed my pockets. Come on here, somebody. There are some Thomases in the White House. There are some Thomases in Congress on Capitol Hill. Come on here, y'all. There are some Thomases in the pulpit. As long as you let me drive a Cadillac and have no lack, then I'm going to worry about my family and not the pews. Come on here. He's the one that drains folks. What is going to happen to me? Why should I risk my life and have to go to Judea for a dead man? Because some people only see you in your condition. They don't see how God can bring you out. Are we reclaiming our men today? There are so many dead men walking around in our communities, in our schools, in our churches, in our grocery stores. And if you are a Thomas, you are one who wears the collar and call yourself a preacher, but all 
all you think about is you and yours. If you are Thomas, you are one of those who wears the surgical hat and the stethoscope around your neck. And although you listen to the thump of a man's heart, you can't hear the cry of that same heart. If you are a Thomas, you may wear the badge of a first responder, but you are the one who responds to yourself first and everybody else has just got to get in line. Am I my brother's keeper? My second point to you today is that I have got good news. Jesus has not forgotten about you. Just in case you are Lazarus and you're listening to me today, you, Jesus, has not forgotten about you. Jesus is the very opposite of Thomas. Jesus understands the extensive impact of Lazarus's life. I want to say that and be quiet for a minute. Because every Lazarus that's out there, I don't care if he got chains around his neck, a neck, I don't care if his pants are sagging right now, he still has an extensive impact. Yeah. Oh, well, he ought to just pull his pants up and he ought to just get the chains from around his neck. And he ought to do this and he ought to do that. You know the talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He probably ought to do those things. But what are you doing to ensure that he can do those things? Are you dropping drugs on his street while you're wearing a badge of a police officer? Come on here, somebody. Are you the one that's putting the dope out there and you're the judge too? Come on. Are, are, are you slipping stuff under the table? Come on here, somebody. And, 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 and that, is that the reason why he feel out there with his pants sagging? Because he got your dope in his pockets weighing him down? I mean, come on here, somebody. Let's tell the truth today. Oh, Jesus understands the extensive impact of Lazarus's life. What is it, Pastor C? I am so glad that you ask, and I have every intention to tell you. Jesus realized that if Lazarus dies, then the alarming statistics which you heard earlier in the sermon will only continue to trend in the wrong direction. Wow. Jesus realizes that Mary and Martha are females in their culture and that the man is important to the survival of the family. Yeah. Jesus yeah. recognizes that Lazarus is a man who has the task of taking care of his sisters. Yeah. Jesus understands that these ladies will be left without a man to speak on their behalf. Jesus Jesus realized that the work that Lazarus once did will now leave a vacancy to be filled. Jesus understands that the bills will not be paid and that Lazarus' income is now gone away. So that may leave some mouths that are unfed. Jesus recognizes that the little boy down the street who actually admired Mr. Lazarus will now have a hole in his little heart at the knowledge of Lazarus' death. Jesus realizes that the sisters may not be able to get Lazarus' pension plan. Come on here y'all. Jesus recognizes that the quite, quite the contrary may be true. Instead of a pension plan, the sisters may get left with unwanted payment plans or bills left behind from their loved one. Jesus understands. So when Lazarus is in the grave, there's an extensive problem that happens and that's why you can't run around here coming against your baby daddy. That's why you can't we got to get right in the black church today. We got to get right in the black community today. Come on here, somebody. You got to understand that we got to start preaching some togetherness before we can cross any other bridges. Oh, you don't like it today. <laughs> but my point number three, and I'm hurrying along today, says it was not recorded that Lazarus had any children. Jesus refuses. Like, write this down. Jesus refuses to bury his friend. That's my point number three. It was not recorded that Lazarus had any children. Lazarus does not have a reported son to carry out the legacy. Y'all see the problem that we got? Y'all yes. yes. see that when Lazarus dies, his sisters now are in trouble. Glory to God. Minister Hill could probably tell you how he used to comb his sister's hair. Come on, y'all. And he used to help the mother with preparing them to get where they needed to go. Come on, y'all. So if something happened to him, so Pastor Z, why are men so precious to you? Because I remember my daddy combing my niece, uh, his niece's hair, sitting between his legs while her mother would go to Gina, Louisiana to do hair. And her children would stay there with us on Friday, get dropped off. It takes a village at my mama's mama house. We would get fed there first. Come on here, somebody. And daddy got tired of April walking around one weekend. He says, come on, I'm going to get... And he, he set her down between his legs, y'all. And she sat there on the floor. And I remember him combing through her hair. Yeah. 
while his sister was going to work because it was important to him to open up his house and his heart for his family. That if somebody needed something, that the house was not just going to be his house. Come on, y'all. Right. But he was going to open up what he had for somebody else to be able to come in. Lazarus is important. Don't you tell me that just because you looked at him, you don't like the way he dressed. You don't like the gold teeth in his mouth. You don't like what he has to say. He doesn't talk the way that you want him, that he's not important. You better see the value in Lazarus today. Uh-huh. It was not recorded that he had children. That means that he did not have a legacy. The devil is after your legacy. Yes, somebody ought to shout yet. Yeah. The devil yeah. wants you yeah. to stop producing. He wants to kill your legacy. But Jesus is calling you forth, Lazarus, yeah. come forth. So my third point again is that Jesus refuses to bury his friend. You got to refuse to bury your son. Yes. You got to say to yourself, I speak over him in the name of Jesus, name God. Of he won't listen to me. Yeah. You know, but God, I put him in your hands, Lord God. And God, build a hedge of protection around about him right now, God. God, call somebody else out there that if he don't listen to me, I'm going to shut my mouth and let somebody else yes, speak Lord. your word to him, yeah. oh God. You got to pray over that husband that when he leaves home, God, I pray for you to protect him and bring him back in the name of Jesus. You got to pray for those who are incarcerated. God, let justice come to pass. We are not to get up off our knees without praying for these sons to come back to the father. Come on here, somebody. Those who are dibbling and dabbling in everything other than Jesus Christ. Father God, I pray that you arrest his mind. That you arrest his soul in the name God of Jesus. We don't pray long enough like we used to. We don't stay on bending knee like we used to. Pastor Crystal was singing up in here that, you know, I'm going to stay on my bending knee. Not just am I going to stay on the battlefield, but when God tells me that this battle ain't mine, then that means that I got to come in the house, get off the battlefield, and get on bending knee. Come on here, somebody. And I got to stay on my knees, and my posture got to be that every time the devil bring him up to make me worry about him, I say, no, I put him in the hands of an all-wise and all-knowing God who is able to take care of and if you got to put him in jail so he don't die for a little bit, then God, I thank you for the jail cell on today, God. That will keep him until you deal with his mind, God, in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Which of you would go out on a limb for your brother, for your father, for your cousin, for your uncle, for your boy, for your homie, for your day one, for your neighbor? How many of you know that by saving a man, you're saving an entire household? Yes, and if you save the household, you got the community. Am I preaching up in here today? How many of you know that by saving a man, you are saving this world? Jesus attended weddings and large gatherings in the Bible, but I cannot think of one time that I know about where Jesus was caught preaching a funeral in the four gospels. I want you to stay right there. I can't remember where Jesus was actually preaching funerals, but he came that we would have life and have it more abundantly. So why are we planning funeral programs? Why are we rest in heaven, rest in love, rest in peace, rest in this and rest in that? No, I'm going to have peace when I go to bed tonight, and I don't intend to stay in that bed. I'm going to get up early in the morning, and that is my rest in peace. I'm not resting in finality. But I am making sure it's too, it's sad that our, that our sons are dying and we don't know if they're saved. Come on here, y'all. It's sad that we don't know if they know Jesus. We're sad that we don't know if they know John 3, 16. Come on here, somebody. So we got to pray. Jesus, Jesus, tell me where Jesus conducted a funeral. He came that we would have life and that we have it more abundantly. It is no way that you're going to find where Jesus conducted a funeral because Jesus can't be at the funeral and that which is dead not come alive. Come on, somebody. He called Lazarus forth. Verse 43, then he speaks to them, things binding him. He says, oh, loose him. Why? Because they're walking around here and they're incarcerated in their minds. My uncle said that he went to a club and there was one way in and one way out and when he went to the club my uncle Ernest had put a gun in the in the sock of his uh, in his sock and he didn't he was dancing and everybody got to moving and when people get to stumping and a dancing on the floor here comes the gun the gun went off and it accidentally shot a man and he sat there in the chair and he said children I am still arrested in my mind today although it was an accident and although I didn't 
didn't go to jail for it. Somebody lost their son that day. Somebody, he didn't even get a chance to have, be a husband. He didn't get the chance to be a father. So I don't know what's in his lowest that he died with. That could have been something that would have saved my life. I don't know if some of the seed that was on the inside of him would have been the one to invent the, in, the, pro, the invention, the solution to the problem that I have today. Put your guns down. They're walking around looking free like Uncle Ernest, but arrested in their minds. Because you live in the jail cell of your mind. Finally, I want to tell you today, I just believe that Jesus will speak to the rejection of our men today and say, loose him and let him go. I believe that Jesus will speak to the systemic racism and say, loose him and let him go. I believe that Jesus will speak to the root of addiction and say, loose him and let him go. I just believe that Jesus will speak to mental to illness today and say loose him and let him go I also believe that Jesus would speak to the spirit of infirmity that's claiming our men and say loose him AIDS, loose him cancer loose him diabetes, loose him high blood pressure, loose him and let him go I believe and led to believe even the more that Jesus would speak to the shame and the guilt of our men and their past and say loose him and let him go I believe that Jesus is speaking to insecurity that is fueled by the rejection that they suffered and say loose him and let him go. I believe that Jesus is speaking to the sexual abuse suffered and silenced by our men because they're too afraid to talk about it because we would, uh, we would, it, it is, it is demasculating. God would say to them today, loose them and let them go. Finally today, I believe that Jesus will speak to the fear that one demon spirit and say loose him and let him go. I want to ask you today, how are you going to pray beyond the sermon today? Are you going to pray and ask God, loose him and let him go? I don't know the root of his problem today, but I know that I am going to be blessed when you loose him and let him go. I'm a single woman, no children, but if I'm on the side of the road and my tire has gone out, God, I need him to come along, so loose him, God. Come on here, somebody. And let him go. Lord, I need my trash put out, but it's too heavy for my feminine body, God. I need you to loose him and let him go. But when God looses him as I close today and lets him go, will you see him for what he was or will you see him for what he is? If I've done my time and if the judicial system is so judicial, and full of justice, why do I pay for it even when I've done my time? Can you see me? Oh, I want this to make it to Capitol Hill. Come on, I ain't scared. Because it's the word of God and Jesus had a ministry that was about justice. We need to pray that, that there's going to come a change. We're almost at our midterm elections and y'all, I'm going to say this up in here today. I can't tell you how to vote, but I'm going to tell you to vote. Yes. And vote with the information that you're getting from the word of God because I stayed in the word of God today. I gave you statistics on purpose. So whoever or whatever would try to come against me, they can't because these are statistics in the word of God. And you can't go, you can't box with Jesus. So I stand as his servant to speak the word of God today. That you got to do these midterm elections because they're more important than anything. That's where your legislation is gonna come from. And see, Satan don't want me to talk about it, but I hope that this sermon is on replay over and over and over again until it makes it to wherever it needs to make it. Yes. Because we got to understand in here that when we vote, that what we're doing at the midterm election is determining how Lazarus is going to come out. And when he comes out, we don't want recid we, we, we're, we have to think about recidivism and how they turn him back in because there's no reform. We got to pray for reform to happen. That while you're in here, we're concerned about you if you're not a dog. And then, you know, animal rights is better than human rights. Come on here. The Bible and Proverbs says, be kind to your beast. So be kind to your beast, but be kind to me too, because I'm not a dog. Our sons are dying in incarceration. My heart used to be gripped to see a man chained to the bed in an intensive care. He can't run nowhere. He on a ventilator and you got him chained to the bed. And, and, and I remember asking the question, why is this patient chained to the bed when he's on a ventilator? That's just our policy. I said, do you realize how stupid your policy is? A man who has lymphoma 
cancer. 28 years old. Lymphoma. Getting discharged from prison while he's in, in, in the hospital, in the ICU. The guard walks out, tells him, well, here's your paperwork. But he has a death sentence on him, not from being incarcerated, but because he got lymphoma while he was incarcerated. That ain't what they telling you. So now mama's got to come see her boy, and she don't know if to be happy or glad because he's released from prison, but he needs a healing. Loose him and let him go. So it's more than for it's it's more than to release them from the grave. You got to loose them and let them go and understand what they're dealing with on their daily. And woman, this ain't our sermon. Our month next month, and we're gonna take it. <laughs> Glory to God. So understand, we are reclaiming our men. We can't be petty. We got to tell, we got to take the grave clothes off of our mind. Mental illness. Well, he ought to do better, and you ought to do better on your knees for him. Hello? Hello? So if I could just get some folks to come into agreement with me today and to just pray and to believe God for the restoration. Because the only way that the church is going to receive and be able to relaunch is when we change our thinking that we command our souls to bless the Lord. We've been picking leaves off of a tree, but we got to get to the root cause of the situation. Policies and procedures. In that same article by Statista.com that I said to you, three things were recommended at least, and I don't remember all three of them. But one thing, one thing is drug charges, and don't, 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 don't sell dope. Mm-hmm. But I understand how we get in the dope game. I was talking to one of the members, and he said, Pastor, let me just show you how the game go. He says, I get out of jail. They tell me I can't leave the house. Before six o'clock, I can't leave the house. I gotta be home by, let's say eight o'clock. What job I'm gonna work? Cause I gotta get on the bus to get to the job. But if the job starts from seven to three, then the way the bus works, and he said, I will show, I will map it out for you. I gotta be out there at 545, but but I'm on the, I, I can't. So that's why I've been in the game. I won't get to see my kids. I can't work a three a evening job because I got to be home by nine. The system. I need you to understand why brothers sell drugs sometimes. If he out there slinging, then he can be with his family when he want to be. He can be his own boss. Come on here. In his mind, he can be his own boss. So, although we do not agree with it, understanding something does not mean I agree with it. You have to come into the understanding. Well, can he do this? And if you are well, can they do this type of thing? And you got that kind of knowledge about you, why don't you make it happen? Mm -hmm. So, that's why your pastor is always talking about getting to the point of mid-elections and understanding that because your president can be a dead duck on the line if the folks in Congress don't let those bills and different things go through like they need. Your legislators. So the people who are representing you from Louisiana, politics begins locally with your vote. So you got to get to the poll. So we got to now take Lazarus and say, Lazarus, we need you to come. And we need you, we're going to get this record expunged. Lazarus, they got one day for that, so I need you to be patient. I don't need you to use your vacation time for another time. That's going to be your vacation day at the job so you can get your record expunged. Lazarus, I need you to come. And Lazarus, I need you to register to vote. Well, it ain't going to make no difference. We're going to see because it made a difference in the in the election. This This previous election just told us for the president of the United States, we should never be able to say again, because people got out there and they kept voting, they kept voting until they pushed the electoral college to where it had to be. So your vote makes a difference. They want to make you think it does not. 
while I understand that I don't agree with it, but I got to understand it so that I can do something about it and speak to that person where they are. We got a lot of brothers who are hopeless and helpless out there on the street in their mind. But we got to make sure that they understand. But we got to love them first so we can have a conversation with them. They got to know that every sister is not beating them up. They got to know that every mother is not turning her back on them. So we're going to pray today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise and we bless you for our sons, our brothers, our husbands, our dads, our uncles, our cousins, our co-workers, Lord God, our community of men, Lord God. We are praying this year that you're going to restore them back to their rightful standing in you. We're praying for early releases. We're praying for minds to turn around in the name of Jesus, God. We're praying that those hurt places and those places where they are embarrassed, those places, God, where they are seated in guilt, Lord God, that you're touching them to come out today, God. God, we were pinned for how we dogged them. We were pinned for how we allowed the world to get into our ears, into our minds about them, Lord. Lord God, what we have lacked, what we need to learn, Lord God, we pray that you will teach us. And even on this wisdom journey through Proverbs, Lord God, that you will give us the wisdom for how to pray for them. We pray for the hearts of mothers and fathers who have lost their sons, God, to be mended right now, God. Yeah. Oh, God, we pray for healing grace in this place and all over is this message, God. Every time that it is on replay, God, God, I pray that this series go all across the globe, Lord God, yeah. that people's lives are going to be made different. And Lord God, that we're going to reclaim, God, that which has been lost, Lord God. God, we don't understand as women the plight of the man. But you do, God, because you made them. Yeah. And we go back to last Sunday, that the more they afflicted them, the more, God, that they begin to produce. As women, let us continue to, to, to do our job, God, as midwives. God, we pray for our sons right there where you are. I want you to think about your sons, your grandsons, and just call their names out into the atmosphere. I want you to think about your uncles. I want you to think about that neighbor, that best friend that you have that is a male, whoever they are, as they cross our minds today, Father God. We speak now in the name of Jesus that you're covering them, God, pulling them back from the pits of hell, Lord God. Take them out the drug game in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Give them options, Lord God. Yeah, God, we praise you even now, God, that those who are in government mental positions, Lord God, that they will do the right thing, God, that they will be servants and ambassadors and ministers unto you, Lord God, and go into this word and understand what the word says. Father God, let us find value in one another, Father God, and it is your eye that allows us to see people, not as they are, but as they can be. We praise you now, God, in Jesus' name, amen. If you're here today and the word is just for you and you're saying, I'm coming for salvation because I want to be saved, if that's you, come to this altar today. Maybe you're coming and you're saying, Pastor, I'm coming not for salvation, but I'm coming for rededication because I'm giving my life back to God. Maybe you're coming today and I hear this in the, in the realm of the spirit. You're going to come and you're going to stand for a man who's not here today. You're going to come and stand proxy for that man today because he needs you, glory to God, to come and stand proxy for him. What do we do when we come and we stand proxy? We're standing in the place because that son, that they're not here today. So we're standing on their behalf and we're trusting God right now. You might need to just stand where you are today in the building. And we're believing God. That something is going to happen for our sons. We're reclaiming them back in the name of Jesus. I myself, I'm standing with the mic, but I'm standing for all my godchildren, my cousins, my uncles. I'm standing for them today. I'm standing for my brother-in-law. I'm standing for my nephews today in the name of Jesus because the enemy cannot have them. And right there where you are today, I want you to pray and open up your mouth right where you are and call those names out because this is the practice that you got to have at home. So open up your mouth right where you are. Lose sight of everybody else. If you're at home, I want you to pray. We're at our altar call today and the altar is full. We're standing all over the building today praying for our sons. Come on in the name of Jesus. Pray for your brother. Father, in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, we're praying ourselves. We're not waiting on pastor to pray. And we're calling their names out. In the name of Jesus, that you will watch over them, God. Our, the fathers of our children, God. We're praying for them, God, to be sustained, not to die early deaths. 
Oh, God, we're praying over them right now, God. Some of us need healing because we lost our sons, God. We lost our brothers. We lost our cousins, Lord God, to the game, Lord God. So we ask that our families are going to be healed in the name of Jesus. Lord, even when I was a child, God, and my cousin Kenneth went home to be with the Lord, God, I pray that healing is taking place, God. I lift up his brother Carrie before you right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Come on, saints of God. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Families need healing on today, but we're praying in the name of Jesus. Lord God, I pray over them out loud today because sometimes we think that people who have gone home to be with the Lord, that those situations are dead. But we can heal even from those dead places in the name of Jesus. Come on and call your brother out. Come on and call that ex-husband out. Still needs Jesus. Your friend who you know is not doing what needs to be done. Come on and pray. Your son, glory to God. That co-worker who you know is wayward. Come on. Glory to God. Ask God to help you to pray from a heart of love today. To cry out before him like never before. You're praying. Because this is what you need to do at your house. Glory to God. We praise your name, God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come on, come on. There at home, I want you praying, 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 praying. 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 You're praying. Because when you're at home, you got to know how to pray. You're praying. When everybody else is asleep, you got to call their name, God. You're praying. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now this is what I want you to do. I want you to pray that God forgive them of their sins. Because sometimes they, while they're in it, they don't have sense enough to ask. But you can ask on their behalf because you're standing in proxy today. And what Jesus did is he took our, he took our place on Calvary. Will you do what Jesus did and pray for your brother? Will you pray for them? Your husband might be in a jail cell today. Glory to God. He may be wrongfully accused. Glory to God. Will you pray for him today? Glory to God. Maybe you haven't met him yet, but God's going to clean him up. Come on and pray right now in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. The next inventor, the next the next person who's going to be the judge. Glory to God. Maybe locked up in his mind today, but he's coming out of that in the name of Jesus because you dare to say, in this place I have prayed. Jeremiah 29 and 12 says that if you call on to me in the place that you call on to me, I'm going to hear you out of that place. Come on. We're praying. I know that it's a long time, but we're going in today because we're tired. And if Jesus says, can you pray with me for an hour? I'm just asking you to come to the altar today and to call their names out. Come on and pray that their minds are going to be released. That the grave clothes are coming. That their grave clothes are coming on. Off of their mind in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Oh, God, I praise you. God, unravel the demon of their mind, God. The lies that the devil have told them, God. That behavior, come on and ask God to let them be free of the behaviors of their forefathers, the behaviors, and to that every generational curse. That everything that they don't even know why they do it, glory to God. That they're being released from it, that they're able to find a place to empty up their heart before God. That their testimony will be that 11, 12, that I, 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 something began to happen to me. And it's because you were praying, glory to God. You got to believe that when you're praying right here, that God is doing something over there. Come on and pray and press in. And if you don't know nothing to say, but Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on them, Lord God. Lord, have mercy. We pray right now, God, on our sons, God. Lord, have, they're yours first, Lord God. They're your sons, God. Lord, have mercy. Somebody cry out, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on them right now, God, in the name of Jesus. God, I talk to them, but I can change their mind about it. But God, I know that you can talk to them, God, and you can change their mind, God. How many of you know we can take the limits off of God today? Take the limits off of God. You can do it, grandmother. You can do it, auntie. You can do it, mama. But God can use somebody else right there to speak to him. There's a turnaround. We believe that there's a turnaround anointing. That they're turning around from it. God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. You are a remnant. Those of you who are standing all over the building today, you are a remnant. And when the remnant begins to pray, God begins to hear like never before. Now, God, you are healer. God, you are healer, God. 
I ask that you heal my body, heal my arm today, God, where healing needs to take place, Lord God, all over this building, God, healing of our minds, healing of our bodies, all spiritual infirmity, back to the pits of hell in the name of Jesus. Come on, saints of God, we got to press our way. We got to press our way. We got to keep trusting God. Glory to God. Come on, keep praying today. Come on, keep praying today. You got one more minute. Oh, God, I praise you. And I believe that you can stay in that next minute. You know enough folks that you can fill that minute up second by second. Come on and release. Ask God to, to, to just re help you to release them into his hands today. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We're crying out before you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Right there, lift those hands as you lift, as you lift your voice and say, thank you, Jesus. you got to believe that it is done. Say, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I praise you for mending us. I thank you, Lord God, for how you're restored. See, the devil wants us to watch the news. And the devil's going to show us all the killing that's going on. But we're going to keep on saying, thank you, Jesus. I remember when my daddy used to smoke. I watched him go out for his last cigarette. And I remember the Holy Ghost arresting my tongue and said, just thank me for your daddy who don't smoke no more. Y'all, it was his last cigarette. And if God could turn me... He went out there on that patio and he smoked, but God said, I want you to say, thank you for my daddy who don't smoke anymore. I need you to give God one more praise and say, God, I thank you for my son that don't sling no more. I thank you for my son that don't smoke dope no more. I thank you for my son that don't go around boring anymore. Come on. I thank you for my daddy that's coming in the house. You got to speak those things that be not. Come on here. And though they were, you got to watch your tongue concerning them. What the Holy Ghost told me that day, the Holy Ghost said, you're the problem. He told me, he said, you're the problem, Beryl, because you keep speaking the same negativity, but he'll change when you say something different. And you got to see them in their calamity, but still speak the word of God over them. Do I have any witnesses today? You got to say, God, I need you to turn my tongue so you can turn him. Glory to God. You may go back to your seats, but as you go back, go back giving God praise. Thanking him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We want to continue in this vein, worshiping the Lord in our giving today. And so if you need that envelope, raise your hand. The ushers are going to serve you here in the sanctuary. We encourage everybody to go by way of give Lafayette in your giving today. And so if you need that envelope, raise your hand. Please do not seal your envelope for the team today as part of our COVID protocols. We thank God for each of you. And we thank God for giving being able to give so that we can continue the work of the Lord in the kingdom. And so as you give those seeds, you are still worshiping. You're still worshiping. Amen. Amen. And so we're worshiping the Lord in our giving today so that we can be a blessing in our community. Glory to God. I'm so excited about the healing anointing that's in this space today. I know when there's an attack that there's going to be healing. There shall be glory after this. That's what you got to know, y'all. And so there's glory coming. Mothers are healing. Fathers are healing. I cannot imagine those whose sons were taken away from them by gun violence at the hands of people who should have been protecting them. But there's going to be glory. We got to believe that God will heal the heart. We got to get to the healing before we can get to the celebration. Amen. Amen. And if you're a parent today and you feel like you didn't do all that you could, you forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Don't walk around with that on you. So we come against that spirit of guilt to loose you and let you go so that you can walk in freedom today. And so you may cry some tears, but nonetheless, hold your head up. Amen. Amen. We praise God and we thank God as we give in faith today. And so we're giving those seeds of faith and we're trusting God. And so we want to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for our seeds and those who are contributing today. You give seed to the sower and you give bread to the eater. We don't eat our seed, but we sow it into good ground that there's going to be a harvest that's going to come up. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Our ushers are serving. As our ushers are serving, let us not forget that we are, um, there's Noonday Grace. Noonday Grace is ha happening every day. And Noonday will be here in just a few minutes that you will have Noonday Grace, another word that's going to carry you through every day. Because we believe that there are those who are struggling and they need a day-to-day -day word. Maybe you don't need it every day, but somebody needs it and is there for you to share and to carry you through. We praise God and we thank God for all of our listening audience who may be virtual today. We thank God for you and thank you for being here. Always stay till the benediction because there is a blessing in the benediction. Thank you so much for your seeds. Thank you for every contribution of faith. And don't forget that you're reading chapter one of Proverbs today. And so we are so grateful. Let us conduct ourselves in this manner. And so the ushers are receiving those envelopes at this time. Thank you for giving uh, by way of Givelify today. We're standing all over the building. And as we stand today, we're standing in faith. Amen. Father, we praise and we bless you for what we, our ears have heard and what our eyes are going to see as a result of what we have heard. We thank you for the healing grace and anointing that is in this space. God, we've already asked you to heal, but God, we just want you to remove our doubt that we won't be Thomases. Help us not to be Thomases, Lord God. And all of us, we've been there before. But God, help us to believe that when we go out for the mission, it's not enough to go out for the mission, but to believe you when you've sent us and to trust you that we're going to have good success. We praise and we bless and we thank you, Lord. And we ask God that when we are tempted to say the wrong things, that we you will turn our tongues in the right direction. Sometimes we're going to have to watch our sons and our daughters go in opposite directions of what we want to see them. But God, we pray that as they go in those directions, that we will just keep speaking your word. We thank you for grandmothers and great grandmothers who are not going to leave this world without seeing. Mothers who are going to not leave this world. Fathers, great grandfathers, grandfathers. They're not going to leave this world without seeing your hand extended upon your children. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Grace and peace. There's a place you can go to be restored and made whole. There's a place just for me to be free and see the unseen on a hill. There's the of Calvary, it gives me mercy, it gives grace, it gives me power to walk in faith, now I believe.